This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Susie Gary. Back to even. The economy finally regains all the jobs lost during the recession, helping stocks extend their record rise. Stars and shareholders. Walmart's annual meeting was part pep rally, part strategy session, but the focus was on the new CEO's plan to stem sagging sales. Market Monitor, our guest tonight, names three stocks he says will produce double-digit returns over the next year. All that and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Friday, June 6th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. Susie Garib is off tonight. Well, the Dow, the Dow Transports, and the S&P 500 closed at fresh record highs today, and with good reason. Another strong jobs report for the month of May. 217,000 jobs were added to the economy last month. That was about what experts were looking for, but the nation's unemployment rate held steady at 6.3 percent. Over the past three months, job growth has averaged a solid 234,000 new jobs a month. On Wall Street, investors reacted by buying up stocks and sending the major averages higher. The Dow up 88 points and is now on watch for Dow 17,000, a record close there. NASDAQ up 25 and the S&P closes a new record high, up 9. Hampton Pearson has more on today's May jobs report and a closer look at where all those new jobs are coming from. There was a post-recession milestone in the otherwise steady-as-she-goes May jobs report. Since February 2010, payroll employment has increased by 8.8 .8 million jobs. That's 100,000 more than the economy lost in just two years at the beginning of the recession. But leading economists say there's still a long way to go. We are back in absolute terms, but of course the population has grown in the meantime, so the, the, the share of the population that has jobs uh, is still far below where it was in 2007. From the Obama White House, a more optimistic response. We now have 51 straight months of job growth, 9.4 million jobs added by our private sector. We saw wages rise this past month. There's definitely a lot more we need to do, but this is the type of progress we'd like to be seeing in the economy. Private sector job growth was an upside surprise. Employers adding 216,000 workers with more than half the gains coming from professional and business services and the healthcare sectors. Other engines of job growth, food services, transportation and warehousing, adding nearly 50,000 new workers to payrolls in May. Blue Apron, a New York-based startup that ships over 600,000 prepackaged meals per week to home chefs across the country is a perfect example. Our concept is we, we want to help you learn in the kitchen, but they're all meant to be healthy, seasonal, fresh produce, um, whole grains, um, and meant to be the kind of food you'd want to cook at home on your own, but you just wouldn't really normally do or know how, and we help make that accessible to people. In less than two years, it has doubled its workforce, including going west to San Francisco. This brand new facility in the Bay Area is in the process of hiring 400 workers for all kinds of jobs. We need more people who can help us um, manage the logistics of that, work in our kitchen, working with different kinds of interesting ingredients, helping assemble our kits with great care and quality that our customers need, and, and working in the um, shipping and receiving side of what we do also. There are lots of new jobs serving folks who still like to eat out. Bars and restaurants added 30,000 new employees last month, 300,000 in the last year. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Hampton Pearson in Washington. Russ Kostrich says the markets have largely already baked in this week's good economic news. He's the global chief investment strategist at BlackRock. Russ, welcome back. If the markets have done, as you suggest, in many segments of the market at least, and already baked in the good news, what does that imply for what investors should do now? Well, right now, markets are benefiting from the environment, and you've got growth accelerating, you've got low inflation, and rates are low, and that's the good news. The problem is that a lot of the parts of the equity market already reflect that good news. In other words, they're pricing. So we still think investors should stick with stocks. They're still cheaper than bonds. Cash yields nothing. But really, it's a matter of picking your spots and finding those part of the equity markets that are still relatively cheap, and have got a little bit of concern or you know, pessimism in the price that gives you some wiggle room if, if things turn to the downside. And where do you find those uh, places where there is pessimism in the price? I think there are a couple places that still look to us to be cheap on a relative basis. Again, nothing is really cheap on an absolute basis.
But compared to the broader market in the U.S., large and mega cap companies look to be cheaper than small cap companies. Uh, many cyclical parts of the market, energy, uh, technology companies also look reasonably priced. And then our, our large recommendation is for investors to cast a wider net. And if you've mostly been invested in the U.S., look at markets in Japan, look at markets in Europe that are much cheaper than U.S. stocks. Do you think Europe can turn around based in part on what uh, Mr. Draghi did earlier this week? So you, I guess, would be putting money there. Certainly what Mr. Draghi did is going to help. You know, Europe has got significant headwinds. But again, going back to my comment before about what's priced in, the thing to remember about Europe is Europe is much cheaper than the United States. So while growth is going to be lower, uh, while we're likely to see lower profitability from European companies, those facts already reflect in the price. Another market we'd look at, Japan. Uh, this is a market trading about 1.2 times book value. That's less than half the U.S. And again, Japan's got a long list of issues people could point to. But what we would say is that a lot of those issues reflect in the price. And Japan is also likely to get a tailwind from its central bank that's going to keep easing long after the Fed starts to tighten. How's the U.S. economy doing, Russ? The economy is doing better. Uh, I, I say better sort of with, with, with a little bit of a sarcasm because it's not great. Uh, we have seen an improvement in the labor market. We're really back to where we were in late 2013. The U.S. economy is printing about 190,000 jobs per month. That's an improvement from the winter. But it's not what you'd expect with a more robust recovery. And I think the key is, while we are improving, there's still these large structural headwinds that are acting to hold back the economy. And they include the fact that wages are slow for a lot of middle-income families. And we still have a lot of people that have dropped out of the labor market. And over the long term, if they don't come back in, that is another uh, drag on growth over the long term. Russ, fantastic to see you. Thanks very much. Thanks, Russ Kostrich Tyler. with BlackRock. And some good news for Uncle Sam's credit rating. After being downgraded a few years ago, ratings agency S&P now says it could lift the nation's credit rating from AA plus to a pristine AAA rating, uh, but only if uh, the company sees more evidence of bipartisan efforts in Washington and a lower national debt. U.S. consumers borrowed a lot more money during April, with credit card debt rising at the fastest pace in more than a dozen years. Overall credit card, overall credit, I should say, rose by nearly $27 billion that month, according to the Federal Reserve, mostly due to car and student loans, along with putting nearly $9 billion more of purchases on plastic. Well, it looks like Bank of America may be paying a heavy debt, $12 billion, to settle probes by the Justice Department and a number of states into the bank's handling of mortgage loans that went bad. Thus far, according to the Wall Street Journal, large banks have agreed to pay almost $100 billion to settle cases related to the 2008 financial crisis. There is a rundown of some of them. Eamon Javers joins us now from Washington with more on the proposed settlement. $12 billion, Eamon, by anyone's uh, stretch, is a lot of money. Where would the money go? Would it go back to the, the victims of the problem or into a government fund? Where? Well, that's one of the many questions about all this, Tyler. The $12 billion figure is media reporting and speculation that's been out there, but you've got to really follow the bouncing ball on this because the number could end up being significantly lower than $12 billion or significantly higher or maybe not much significantly higher than $12 billion, but still uh, a lot of negotiations going on behind the scenes here. What we don't know is where this thing is going to land, when the settlement is going to come out. Once it does, though, your question is a good one. Typically what's done in these cases is they end up finding some of the money into a pool of, of uh, finances that go back to some of the people who were hurt by the original mortgage processes. And then after that, the rest of it just goes to the United States Treasury as part of a, a settlement into the general funds. So it's usually divided up into a series of tranches. Where that goes is all part of this behind-the-scenes negotiation that's going on right now, Tyler. Bank of America has already paid uh, really tens of billions to settle claims uh, arising from mortgage problems and others. Are we now likely to see other banks settling investigations uh, stemming from the housing problems? We are. It's clear now that the Department of Justice is trying to go back and sort of claw back as much of the losses as they can in, in order to get some of that money uh, back to the people who were hurt in the housing crisis and to demonstrate that it's able to do something, even though we're now years after the fact. Uh, there's definitely a concerted effort here in Washington going on. Eamon, thank you very much. Eamon Jabbers, have a great weekend.
On this Jobs Friday, the nation's biggest private employer, Walmart, held its annual shareholders meeting. But despite the star power and the festive atmosphere, Walmart has a lot of work to do following five straight quarters of sales declines here in the United States. Investors sent shares of the world's biggest retailer a fraction lower today. Sarah Eisen was on hand at today's shareholder meeting in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and what changes executives are planning to turn things around. Harry Connick Jr., Pharrell, Robin Thicke. Not the Grammys, but Walmart's annual shareholder meeting, where employees and investors, 14,000 of them, come every year to hear executives speak, vote on board memberships and shareholder proposals, and of course, enjoy the all-star performances. It is a festive event, no question about it. But if you're a Walmart shareholder, recent performance has been disappointing. In fact, over the last five years, you would have missed out on half of the S&P 500's rally. That's why Walmart executives are kicking it into high gear, introducing all sorts of interesting strategies. We need to be at the forefront of innovation and technology. We will lead with urgency to get ahead of change. McMillan, who's only 100 days into the job as CEO, talked a lot about innovation, like 3D printing and getting Walmart more involved in hot tech trends. On the retail front, it's focused on neighborhood markets. Unlike super centers, there's smaller stores which carry pharmaceuticals and groceries. Walmart is set to open hundreds of them this year. Walmart's also testing convenience stores like 7-Eleven, which plan to offer everyday low prices, all in an effort to adapt to changing consumer habits and slowing sales. But today, shareholders were in celebration mode. They're going to be letting us know different statistics, new programs that are going to be coming out, things we can look forward to. The atmosphere here, everybody's cheerful. It's just amazing. We love our Walmart. For Nightly Business Report, Sarah Eisen, Fayetteville, Arkansas. And still ahead, looking for stocks that will do well as the economy improves? Our market monitor likes some companies you surely know. He'll tell us which ones and why. Calls at General Motors, the automaker announcing four more today for another 90,000 vehicles for airbag related issues in late model Chevy Silverado trucks, GMC Sierras, Chevy Tahoes, Buick Veranos, Camaros, and other makes. These latest recalls uh, makes a total now of nearly 14 million GM cars and trucks uh, called in so far this year. Well, if you don't own a car, you may be familiar with Uber, the app based car service. Uh, that competes against traditional taxi cabs and black cars in a lot of U.S. cities. Uber says it just completed another round of investor financing, securing $1.2 billion in funding, giving the company a market value. This is a taxi service, basically. A market value of more than $18 billion. Concerns about accounting issues pressured shares of Hertz, and that's where we begin tonight's market focus. The car rental company is restating its 2011 financial results and reviewing its records for 2012 and 13, according to a regulatory filing. Hertz also expects its first quarter results to be below analyst estimates because of costs related to that review. Shares down 9 percent, 27.73 was the close. UPS named a company veteran as its next CEO. The package delivery giant's chief operating officer, David Abney, will take the top job September 1st. Uh, the company's current chief, Scott Davis, will become non-executive chairman. Abney spoke today about the company's future. The biggest challenge, I think, is that we're going to continue to grow our international business. Emerging markets are growing rapidly. We have responded, and we're going to continue to respond uh, accordingly. Shares were off just a fraction at 103.59. Nuts to you. Or maybe not. Shares of Diamond Foods plummeted today after the company posted disappointing results. Earnings came in well below expectations, which the food company blamed on weakness in its nut business. Diamond did say it was pleased with its snack unit, which includes pop secret popcorn. Still, shares were down almost 11 percent to 29.74. That's a lot of almonds. A report that Sears CEO Eddie Lampert met with outgoing Ford CEO Alan Mulally drove shares of Sears higher today. The two reportedly discussed how to turn around the struggling retailer's business. The stock was up almost 2% to 
and 80 cents. After the close, billionaire investor Carl Icahn disclosed a 9% stake in Family Dollar. Icahn says he believes Family Dollar shares are undervalued and he plans to discuss strategies with the company's board, which may include strategic alternatives. Shares spiked uh, after the news was reported. During the regular session, the stock was up a fraction to $60.53. Our market monitor tonight is expecting a 5 to 10 percent in correction in the markets this summer, and he views it as healthy. And he says investors should buy stocks when and if it happens. He's Phil Orlando, chief equity strategist at Federated Investors. Phil, welcome. Good to have you with us. Tyler, We're certainly due for a correction. What could trigger it? Well, Tyler, you've got uh, Treasury yields and, and stock prices that are both uh, overbought here. The VIX, you talked about that before, is sitting down here at, uh, at a cycle low. Uh, so you're certainly poised for any bad news, and if that were to happen, certainly we could see uh, a modest summer hiccup. But again, if that were to happen, we would use that as a buying opportunity. There were reports earlier this week that the Fed is concerned about um, complacency in the market. Uh, the low VIX would suggest that people are a little bit complacent. There's not a lot of hedging going on or whatever. Uh, are you concerned that investors have grown complacent, that the, that the glide path has been a little too smooth after last year's big run-up? Certainly. There are a lot of fundamental concerns in the marketplace uh, from an economic standpoint as to whether or not the second half bounce is going to be as good as the second quarter. Uh, you've got a lot of geopolitical risk issues uh, in the Middle East and, and certainly concerns about the Fed, how they uh, transition monetary policy uh, in, the, uh, in the wake of uh, going from Bernanke to Yellen. So there are certain Certainly any number of things that could uh, could pop up over the course of the summer. Let's uh, go to your buy list. If that uh, correction does eventuate, it's led by Alaska Air. Why do you like it? Well, the, uh, the airline companies have uh, found religion. Uh, they uh, have rationalized pricing and capacity. This company is very well managed. It has a very differentiated root structure. Stock's done well, but we think we could do another 10% or so, 15% or so in the next year or so. And uh, Boeing, uh, which is obviously related to the airlines, uh, but in a different, a different way, you like it? Well, you've got uh, about a four-year backlog on that new 787 plane, which is extraordinarily uh, fuel efficient. So as, as the airlines continue to make money and look to upgrade their fleet uh, with better technology, better fuel efficiency, uh, this plane is getting a disproportionate amount of interest. And as I said, they've got a four-year backlog on, on orders. Well, we started with an A, we went to a B, now we're going to go to an H, Home Depot. That sounds like a play on the consumer and housing economy. Well, the consumer is back. Uh, Christmas, it was the worst Christmas uh, since 2009, but Easter was pretty good. Uh, the weather is rebounding, so you're going to get some uh, better lawn and garden sales. And we do think that uh, housing is going to make a modest recovery here. We do not think that the housing market is dead. Uh, the depot has been going sideways for the last year or so. Uh, we think the stock will work higher as those trends begin to materialize. What about interest rates, Phil? You know, the Fed is probably going to end up, uh, end its uh, buying of bonds sometime later this year. Interest rates might start to move up. Is that a threat to the uh, market? Uh, not at all, because the normalization of uh, the Fed funds rate, which we think will start the middle of next year, the end of the taper, which we think will happen by the end of this year, the market should embrace that as a positive. The Fed would not be normalizing monetary policy unless they were completely comfortable that the economy is, is sufficient to uh, be able to operate on its own without this extraordinary support of monetary policy. I would think that they're going to wait and see on interest rates and be very data-driven about that. And there, there, there's no obligation that they have to uh, raise interest rates, is there? And, and that's exactly the right term, data dependency. The Fed is going to evaluate the data. Uh, it's probably going to be a year before they take this step. Uh, and if the data over the course of the next year does not support it, and by that I mean we're looking at trend line or better GDP growth, you know, that 3 to 3.5% three level. Uh, we want to see job creation continue at this, you know, 200,000 plus pace over the course of the next year, consumer spending strong, manufacturing strong. If those components are not there, uh, then we don't expect that the Fed is going to commence uh, a tightening of monetary policy. Uh, Phil, any disclosures on Alaska, Boeing, or Home Depot? Uh, we own all of those stocks in the Federated Global Allocation Fund. All right, Phil, thank you very much. Always good to see you. Thanks for having me. Phil Orlando with Federated. Well, today is D-Day, and President Obama and Russia's Vladimir Putin were among the world leaders in Normandy today, commemorating the 70th anniversary of the Allied invasion, an event that helped turn the tide in World War II. 
President Obama spoke at the Nor Normandy American Cemetery and Memorial where nearly 10,000 U.S. soldiers Barack are buried. Obama. We'll be right back. Mesdames, Messieurs, le Président des États-Unis d'Amérique. Finally on this Jobs Friday, if a summer blockbuster is on your entertainment menu, it could include a superhero or two, and superheroes are the thought behind our latest bright idea. One enterprising Michigan woman became a mother of invention when her boy's birthday party presented her with a necessity. She needed a superhero. She needed capes. So she caped, she saw, she conquered. Holly Bartman, mom, superhero, businesswoman, Sort of. I didn't know anything about business. It was a hunch. Back in 2006, her son Owen, about to turn four, requested a superhero birthday party. Holly made capes, and the party was just super. They just started running around our backyard, and that's about all it took. We didn't have to do any entertaining. One of the moms at the party noticed. And she said, you need to make these. I said, well, you know, uh, we'll see. Bartman decided to give it a try a few weeks later. She bought a hundred bucks worth of material, spent a few hours sewing capes, and got some help putting up a website. I would make a few, sell them, use that money to buy more fabric, then it just it kept snowballing. By 2009, Bartman was taking in three times what she used to make as a school teacher, but her life was consumed by the work. Her house engulfed in materials, so she moved to a nearby office. That's where she met Justin Draplin. I was like, what are you doing? And uh, she explained that she's making superhero capes, and I'm scratching my head thinking there's no way anybody's going to make any money doing this. So he did a little research. Capes are cool, and there's 20-something million kids under the age of seven in the U.S. So I came to Holly and said, you know, I, I think I can sell these for you. He would bring me stacks of orders. <laughs> <laughs> I was so overwhelmed and, you know, he teases me. He said, every time I walked into your office, it looked, it looked like you were going to cry. <laughs> the tears are long gone now. With Draplin's help, Holly Bartman's hobby became a business. This is Mabel. How may I save your day? Superfly so. kids. Outside Detroit, 17 employees make capes, masks, arm blasters, even customized tutus. Wholesale orders from Zulily and Old Navy helped take them to another level. 2013 revenues, $2.3 million. People have asked me, why don't you have this made overseas? And my attitude has always been, there are plenty of people to do it here. You know, as far as um, being able to customize, that's not something you can do overseas. And, and that's what we're about. Up, up, and away! Superheroes, though, are about giving back. In April, Superfly Kids put on Detroit's first Super Run. Bye, Capes were encouraged, but not required. They raised thousands of dollars for local charities. We all have our, our attributes that we can provide for the, for the greater good. And the superhero theme is a pretty unanimous, uh, non-confrontational, all-inclusive uh, way to do that. Even when cash was tight, Holly Bartman donated capes to schools and charities, bringing dreams to life. After all, aren't all moms superheroes? I think so. We just hide our capes. <laughs> and maybe, just maybe, it turns out that being a good mom can be good business, too. Imaginative play, they need to do that. That's part of childhood. So we're helping them do it. And there is my cape. Holly sent us a cape. This one doesn't look half bad, does it, folks? With great business news comes great responsibility. Well, it's not just the uh, business that has been growing out there in Michigan. They're hoping to take the super run now into 30 cities during the next year, coast to coast. The next one happens to be tomorrow morning in Frankenmuth, Michigan at 8.30 a.m. They sent a mask, but my producer said don't wear it. That'll do it for Business Report for tonight. I'm Tyler Matheson. We got to go. We'll see you Monday.
I'm Tyler Matheson with a nightly business report news brief. The Dow and the S&P climbed to fresh record highs after a solid May jobs report. 217,000 jobs were added last month, and the nation's jobless rate held steady at 6.3%. The economy has now recovered all the 8.7 million jobs lost during the Great Recession. Here's how Wall Street reacted, and positively, the Dow up 88 points, closing in on the 17,000 mark. The Nasdaq was up by 25, and the S&P added 9. Americans borrowed a lot more money during April, nearly $27 billion more, with credit card debt rising at the fastest pace in more than 12 years. The ratings agency S&P says it could raise the nation's credit rating to triple A, but only if lawmakers start working together and the national debt is reduced. And tune in to Nightly Business Report here on your public television station.